Okay, this is David Fizzino, and welcome back to part two of our discussion on population issues for anthropology and world problems at Commonwealth University of Pennsylvania. So we're going to start off in this particular screencast looking at world population figures and facts as well as projections for the future. Yeah, 2019 figure here shows the population by continent. Uh, 1,000 million or essentially 1 billion in the Americas, uh, 1,275 million in Africa, or 1.275 billion, 750 million in Europe, and the largest continent here, uh, 4,550 million or 4.55 billion uh, in Asia, and the smallest continent we have 40 uh, million uh, in Australia. So moving on here, if we were going to look at this by contoured in country, we can see the world population overall. And of course, this is one of those world mappers that looks at particular issues and then gives a relative size uh, or distribution. So you can see um, clearly here uh, both India uh, as well as China quite accentuated here in terms of the global map, in terms of their relative size compared to their geographic size. That's one way to visualize the data. Another way to think about it would be in this pie chart that I made on June 6, 2022, which was taken from Worldometer's uh, population by country, which comes from UN data. Um, so this is the most recent data that I could find showing the uh, top 10 countries as, all, as well as the uh, remaining countries. So we have China, with the largest current global population of 18.47% of the total population, uh, which, as we'll see in later slides, is, is right around 7.9 billion, uh, very close to 8 billion. Uh, if you go to the world of meters, they actually have a counter that shows you uh, the number of people and the, the acceleration or the, the rate at which it's growing. India comes in very close next at 17.7%, with the United States only comprising 4.25% of the global population. Now, this is important if we consider population uh, in as an issue in and of itself, but we also have to think about resource consumption as well as um, rates of uh, pollution and emissions, particularly for carbon dioxide, uh, where the United States and China are seemingly trading positions or have done so over the last decade or so. We see 3.51% in Indonesia, and then in the 2% range, a uh, number of countries uh, right now, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil, Pakistan, uh, and then Russia at 1.87, Mexico at 1.65% of the global population, meaning all other countries uh, are about 42.24%. And so this gives you an idea of the relative scale and distribution of population at the country level, at least for the top 10, in relation to the rest of the world as a whole. So how does this look in terms of the overall projections for global population growth? And this comes from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the Population Division 2019 world population prospects. Um, and so, and from an earlier document as well at the, U, as, at the UN, uh, population growth is slowing. Um, so we're seeing a continued growth of pop population, but the speed or the acceleration uh, is it's actually decelerating, right? So um, one earlier statistic that came out is it took 12 years uh, to add 1 billion between when we went uh, it's a global population between five and six billion, and then up until six to seven billion. So it's a it's an overall decrease in population over time. And again, a lot of this is based on projections and indeed measuring population, even at the global level or current levels, is uh, very much an estimate based on 
number of reported births and deaths and how much of this is captured and shared uh, at a given time in terms of statistics, facts, figures, these sorts of things. So some of the estimates, when I first started teaching this class back in 2014, uh, perhaps you were in middle school um, or even maybe even earlier um, in your educational journey, uh, but the, uh, the number was about 7.2 uh, billion people. Uh, these are all UN figures, 7.7 uh, .7 billion in 2019. Uh, the world o meters has an estimate of between 7.9, uh, I believe it's even 7.95 uh, billion now, uh, nearly at 8 million. Uh, and then 8.5 is the expected at the UN level in 2030, uh, 2050, 9.7, uh, and then 10.9 in 2000 or 2100. Now, the variance in this range can be anywhere between 6.7 to all, up to 16.6 .6 billion. So it shows the wide range of what can potentially happen based on a, a number of different uh, assumptions that are made uh, in the model, including probably a lot to do with uh, resource distribution, potential for sea level rise, um, uh, supply chain disruptions um, that, of course, we're seeing quite a bit of uh, since 2020, 2021, and, and into 2022. So how have how has this been approached at the country level? Well, there are a number of different national approaches to um, to uh, the the issue of population. And some of these might be encouraging a population and encouraging the group in terms of Foucault's bio, idea of biopower to have more children. This is a very pro-natalist policy. And arguably some of the things like tax breaks that we see within countries like the United States for having more children are an example of a pro-natalist policy. Uh, China's one-child policy has certainly been something that's been talked about uh, by a number of uh, scholars and commentators uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and of course, this has been modified over time with a number of exceptions. Um, and uh, in essence, um, the encouragement to have only one child. Um, now, of course, there, there was concern here about the uh, sex of the child in terms of the boys that were being desired. So there was a, a lot of uh, female uh, infanticide uh, abortions uh, and whatnot, and or just not taking care of, um, of, of girls that were born. Uh, we see, of course, this is a lot wrapped up in how U.S. news media reports on China as well. Um, so the China's one child, child policy, you know, you, you were essentially, uh, if you had a boy, that was it, you know, and potentially could have exceptions to that based on geographic area as well. Um, so it wasn't a, a universal policy by any means. Um, so moving uh, into a more ethnographic coverage of population issue, we see Laura Braff's Somos Muchos, We Are So Many, Population Politics and Reproductive Othering in Mexican Fertility Clinics. This comes to us from the journal Medical Anthropology Quarterly, which is available in your course resources. So you can take a look at that a little bit more if you'd like. But what I'm going to do here in the screencast is go through the main points or highlights uh, that I think it's important for you to consider in thinking about national uh, approaches or state approaches to the issue of fertility. So Braff begins her discussion of um, Mexican uh, reproductive issues, the history of reproductive policy in Mexico. So, um, so the independence of uh, Mexico, uh, independence from Spain, so this pronatal uh, policy overall. Uh, 1910 is the onset of the Mexican Revolution. For 10 years, uh, later leaders sought to fortify the nation with natural growth. Between 1940 and 1970, we see a 157% increase in population, which, inc which coincides with the population boom in the developing world. Paul Ehrlich writes his book in 1968. Commentators are out there before that talking about the demographic transition model. So in the 1970s, there was this move towards more responsible parenthood, or this is how it's framed by the state. 
um, state of Mexico. So there's massive family planning programs that are facilitated by the United States. The overall goal is to decrease the fertility rate, which is certainly accomplished. Mexico in 1960, the average was 7.3 children per woman uh, to 2010, where we have 2.2 uh, children per woman, which is very similar to what the United States is, uh, 2.06 children per woman. Um, yet this uh, some policy uh, in Mexico, as well as officials, are pointing to this issue of an overpopulation problem uh, in Mexico specifically. So diving a little bit more into the cultural aspects of this, and again, this is uh, painting with fairly broad brushstrokes at the entire country level, but Laura Braff goes through and talks about the spiritual and moral balance that goes along with reproduction in Mexico. So the idea here is that God sends one a child. So this is a, a gift, essentially, from, the, from divine, from divinely ordained, these sorts of things. There are these ideas of gendered virtues, familial values, and ideals, and that Mexicans as a whole are fairly family and child-centric. Motherhood is uh, valued as a whole, as an essential part of uh, womanhood. And then the um, idealized portrait of the Virgin de Guadalupe, the maternity has centralized the idea of idealized womanhood. So the policy realm of things, the legal realm of things, comes in with Article 4 of the Mexican Constitution, which guarantees the right of all Mexican citizens to reproduce. However, as Braff discusses in her article, the state encourages unevenly uh, this right to reproduce along overlapping lines of race, class, and religion, mainly with family planning programs that are initiated to curb population growth in rural, rural areas, as well in, in the contrast to that in urban areas, fertility clinics to promote population. And they, Braff draws from earlier work of Ginsburg and Rapp in stratified reproduction in the United States. Um, the idea of stratified reproduction is the procreation of uh, families of elites are privileged over and even facilitated by non-elites. So non-elites will act as surrogates or nannies for elites. And of course, uh, as Ginsburg and Rapp are writing about this, this is in the United States, particularly U.S. South, and this idea of nannies, right? And this idea of um, essentially um, African-American women who are caring for um, white children. Um, this is this idea of disciplined breeders for, and caregivers. This is related um, to um, stratified reproduction or, or related to discourses of reproductive othering. And this mirrors the binaries of the West versus the East, the modern versus backward and superior versus inferior. So in the discussion of assisted reproductive technologies available in clinics and urban centers, this essentially reinforces the dichotomy. So the focus here is on providing these services to elites due to the high cost associated with this. And this would include in vitro fertilization as well as artificial insemination. In Mexico, women are utilizing assisted reproduction technologies juxtapose those uh, against the uh, women uh, in rural and indigenous and ur uh, communities as well as the urban poor who have long been construed as over reproducers. Women deem themselves in Braff's work. She goes out and does these interviews and I'll highlight some of the excerpts for of this uh, a little bit later uh, in the next screencast. Uh, by claiming to be whiter and worthier persons, parents, and citizens uh, than others than others are that are based on their fertility practices. So the access criteria to these assisted reproductive technologies, uh, in order to be eligible for infertility care, you have to be a Mexican citizen. Uh, women have to be under 36, uh, with men under 56, be married or in a stable heterosexual union. So again, this is privileging heteronormativity as well. Uh, have one or no children, uh, have no other health insurance, have proof of prior infertility exams. And so infertility is conceptualized as an urban problem with those in rural areas like Oaxaca, being essentially uh, having these natural processes in women uh, that lack extra domestic goals and lack of uh, sexual self-control. So from one of the interview participants, I have a niece in Oaxaca at 15 years old. I think her first period came and she had her baby. I tell you, she had her first menstrual period and then she had children. In the Pueblos, the girls have children's, children rapidly. 
more than anything else, they don't have a place to go or aspirations that I know of. So they grab their first boyfriend and right away they get pregnant. 